so that folks who aren't able to join us today can, um, can tune in later. One, okay, I see some people trickling in from the waiting room. Yay, hello. <laughs> A lot of names. Feel free to turn on your video if you'd like. We'd love to see your faces. <laughs> okay. I'm just going to give folks maybe one more minute and then get started. Um, I mean, oh yeah, feel free to introduce yourselves in the chat and where you're calling from. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and get started because we have a lot of great stuff to hear and learn from today. Um, hi, everyone, and welcome to our panel, Filipina, Filipinex, American Futures, Urging the Horizon, moderated by the incredible Marie Paspe. Happy Filipino American History Month, everyone. I'm Justine Lee, the Programs Director of the Asian American Arts Alliance, or A4. In a quick accessibility check, I am an East Asian woman with medium length black hair, wearing a gray long sleeve shirt, and I am calling from the unceded lands of the Lenape peoples. Thank you all so much for joining us tonight to hear from our intergenerational panel of Filipina and Filipinex artists discuss their experiences of migration, mobility, sexuality, and ownership, among other things. Um, those of you who are familiar with A4 know that we are dedicated to ensuring greater representation, equity, and opportunities for Asian American artists and cultural organizations through resource sharing, promotion, and community build building. So we have a lot of events, including panels like this one, that help accomplish that mission. Um, and there are actually a few events we'd like to share that are upcoming. Um, if we go to the next slide. Um, I believe the next slide. Okay, well, I will just tell you about the event. Um, there we go, yes. Uh, this Saturday, which is tomorrow from two to 4 p.m., there will be a three act activation of Cheyenne Concepcion's Disappearing Saint Malo sculpture at the Socrates Sculpture Park. So in act one, historian and scholar, Dr. Michael Menor Salgarolo reads St. Malo's unexpected legacy outlining St. Malo's radical vision. In act two, Atlantic Pacific Theater performs Nothing is Too Big is Nothing is Too Big, a short play by Carlo de, lo, de los Reyes. To close out the program in act three, Capua Yoga's Paul Pochico hosts a movement and mindfulness workshop centered on the indigenous Filipino wisdom of Kapwa or shared inner self. And then, so I hope you all can check it out. That's tomorrow. Um, and that's an image of the sculpture. And then next we have on Tuesday, November 15th, we are hosting our final town hall of the year on the topic of writing. Our featured presenters are author Gina Apostol and Ryan Lee Wong. If you have a writing project to pitch or want to network with other AAPI writers, we encourage you to attend. And we're dropping the link in the bio. Or sorry, oh my gosh, I'm so used to Instagram. I said drop link in bio. Uh, we're dropping the link in chat. <laughs> uh, you can find out about more events like this and post your own on the A4 community calendar on our website. It's free to you, so please check it out. Um, and then we'll also drop a link in the chat with, for that. Uh, you can stay in touch with us by signing up for our newsletter, um, following us on social media at AA Arts Alliance. Um, and if you'd like to support the work that we do, you can, um, you can donate. Okay, so now that the housekeeping is out of the way, um, well, actually, there's a little more housekeeping I need to do. Um, here are just some Zoom protocols. Um, please mute yourself if you are not speaking. If you have any questions, please send us a message. Um, 
via the chat. Um, there's also the raise hand function accessible by clicking on the participants icon. Um, there will be time for Q&A after the panel. And so we will be taking questions um, either in chat or just visually if you wanna raise your hand and let us know. Um, we also have closed, cap in, closed captions available. If you would like to enable captions, you will find a CC um, icon at the bottom of your Zoom screen menu that has the words live transcript below it. If you click on that icon, it should enable captions. Um, and I think that's, it has already been enabled. Um, okay, and a couple quick announcements. Um, as always, we wanna thank our supporters at Capital One, Con Edison, the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs in partnership with the City Council, the New York State Council on the Arts with support of Governor Kathy Hochul and the New York State Legislator, uh, the National Endowment for the Arts, the Howard Gilman Foundation, and so many other generous individuals for making our programs possible. And I also want to make a land acknowledgement. Uh, because we're meeting virtually today, I'd like to share a digital land acknowledgement written by Canadian theater artist, Adrian Wong, as we are all occupying different physical spaces. Okay, here we go. Since our activities are shared digitally to the internet, Let's also take a moment to consider the legacy of colonization embedded within the technologies, structures, and ways of thinking we use every day. We are using equipment and high-speed internet not available in many indigenous communities. Even, even the technologies that are central to much of the art we make leave significant carbon footprints, contributing to the changing climates that disproportionately affect indigenous peoples worldwide. I invite you to join me in acknowledging all of this, as well as our shared responsibility to make good of this time and for each of us to consider our roles in reconciliation, decolonization, and allyship. Thank you. Okay, so let's get started. It is my pleasure to introduce Marie Paspe, who will lead tonight's panel and introduce the rest of the panel shortly. But first I wanna give Marie um, her due. Uh, Marie is a dance and vocal performer, choreographer, movement director, educator, and culture bearer based in Lenape Hoking, also known as Brooklyn, New York, a Filipina descent of Batangas and Iloilo, Philippines. She was born in Singapore, grew up in Mississauga, Canada, and migrated to Bellingham, Massachusetts in 2000 and received U.S. citizenship in June 2019. Her creative interests excavate Filipinx American diasporic identity work within spaces of memory, fascia, and time, igniting kapwa, which is shared identity, in communities and process. Her work to reroute identity with site specific dance and installation works exists within and also juxtapose the experiential, the Eurocentric, and the white dominated space. Her work has been presented internationally in Germany, Israel, and the Philippines, and nationally in New York, Mass Smoka, and LA. Marie has performed with the Bill, Bill T. Jones Arnie Zane Company since 2018 and is the Asian American Arts Alliance 2002 Jaden Wong Fellow. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Marie. Hi. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much, Justine, for that very very um, well said bio. Um, thank you. I want to thank everyone who is here tonight because this is a labor of love and also a, a much needed conversation. I feel specifically within this month, which is Filipino American History Month, but also in the changing climate of the dance world and performance art world in which I believe the Asian American spirit is being seen and it is something very important to talk about of who is still left behind and who are also um, who are also doing the work of not allowing stories and narr narratives to be left behind. So I'm coming from you very humbly. I'm coming into this panel with a lot to learn. And I, I do want to acknowledge that even the names I see here, many friends, many hearts, I really know the wisdom that's in this panel between all five of us, but also 
the 60 people who RSVP, there's wisdom in every single person who is going to or currently listening to this now. And I want to honor that um, as a femme and female and a woman and presenting how I do, the challenges and privileges that come with that is a very, um, it, I don't take that lightly. And I know the panelists on this, um, in this discussion don't either. So we come from a perspective and a very particular narrative of which we want to share with the communities of our own and also who don't identify with us. And we also acknowledge that there are people still missing in our conversation that we do not want to take that space from either. Thank you. So um, thank you for spotlighting me. Okay, I, I am, I don't have to do my bio. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I'm a moderator, um, culture bearer and gatherer as well as a performer and artist. And I uh, would like to pass the mic to one of four panelists, Anito Gavino. Um, Bye. Um, my name is Anito. My birth name is Anibel Gavino. Um, the first part of my name comes from Andrea, my grandma, Melilla. And Lilia, which is a Spanish name. So I've been trying to change my name <laughs> for several several times. People know me as Ani, but now I'm going to do so which um, means spirit in Tagalog. I am originally from Panay, from Benzayas and Ilonga, um, just like Marie's other half from Ilonga. I <laughs> I'm a mother to Malaya. Um, my first part of my career, I was a, I mean, I still was a dancer, but I was a full-time professional dancer with Cleo Parker on the Dance Ensemble and Dallas Black Dance Theater, and then, and many others until actually I got a company on my list, and then I realized I need to tell my story. And I keep um, I keep supporting other people's visions, <laughs> and it's time for my vision to come forward. And I'm hitting many words with my story, but then at the same time, when I'm telling my story, I'm able to share that not only with the world but with Malaya. She, she's growing up in the process of my my art making. So I, in a, um, just to sum it up, like the things that I do, I'm also a, an educator. I teach at Millbury College. I'm also a filmmaker, and I'm also a choreographer. I do a lot of site specific. I, oh yeah, and I am working on a book as well. <laughs> and yeah, I'm a writer for Thinking Dance and also trying to decolonize in whatever whatever tool or whatever portal there is for inscription. Um, so that's it. Um, I will pass it on. I mean, your sound is a little, oh, so sorry. Oh, so, <laughs> does it echo for you all? Mm. What did happen earlier? Um, should I pass it on to Malaya? Okay. Um, I am Malaya Ulan, um, which means free green in Tagalog. Uh, I'm 14, and the pronouns are she, her, and I am a dancer, uh, a poet. I should just read my first book through the book. Um, but Yes, yeah, so I'm in the first book, and I'm also writing filmmaking right now. Um, yeah, I'll pass it on to the next person. Mic check. <laughs> okay. Um, 
Hi, everyone. I feel so honored to be um, part of this circle. My name is Kimberly Tate. I use she and they pronouns. I'm sitting on Munsing Canarsie Lenape land, um, also known as Brooklyn. I um, have a multidisciplinary practice that involves um, architecture and movement and education and um, space making, space holding. Um, I, one project, I build labyrinths for movement experiments and I'm really interested in, in um, our inner, inner sense of self, connecting with others, connecting with the space around us. Um, I teach design and I'm interested in an embodied approach to that. So it comes out in, in how I teach and also in this social practice where holding space for people to connect with themselves, connect with the space, um, connect with each other. And um, my family is from the Eastern Visayas. I was born in Tacloban, um, where what I, I'm in a process of um, restoring culture for myself. I'm a mother. My child um, is two and a half years old. So in, in that, um, in this new phase of my life, it's been a revolution. Other um, caregivers here <laughs> can attest. And I'm really feeling into this intergenerational, um, the intergenerational work. Um, I think I'll say that's that's all I'll say for now, and we'll unfold more in conversation. Thank you. Mic check here. Is that good? Awesome. So grateful to be back with A4. I it's been maybe even eight years since I've been. Uh, on a panel or have been part of something. So it's so great. I've changed so much. The world has changed and it feels absolutely right to return in this form. Um, I am a director for theater, musicals and film. Uh, also a choreographer and an, an intimacy choreographer as well. Uh, and also a uh, professor. Uh, I focus on work that humanizes issues. I work nationally and internationally. Uh, I'm interested in interdisciplinary work. I play with form and that's actually my approach to musicals is that I look at it as an intersection of form and dance theater and that's really my focus. So I'm working uh, all over regionally, um, but also at festivals internationally. I'm based here on, uh, on the land of the Kumeyaay here in San Diego. I am the head of directing um, where I, I'm the head of directing at San Diego State University in the Department of Theater, Television, and Film, uh, where I am uh, associate professor here uh, and um, have a wonderful home and a beautiful dog. <laughs> and my parents are both um, physicians uh, who immigrated to Pennsylvania, where I grew up. I went to NYU, studied directing in undergrad, uh, went to UCSD where I studied directing my master's, um, excuse me, directing in my master's um, and I have a very full career doing what I love here in San Diego and wherever the work takes me. Um, I look forward to sharing more about my process and learning from everyone and, and how also about how my identity and how I take space as a leader in this field um, and learning how people are receiving me as a leader in this field. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. So I guess we shall start, huh? Cheese <laughs> miss. Um, <laughs> I, um, you know, I, talking to each and every one of you, I admire and respect all of your crafts and your processes. And I've been following um, each of your work for some time. And I think for myself, like I come to you as a performer, I'm predominantly as a performer, as well as like a vessel for others. And kind of relating back to what Ani, you said earlier, how your so much of your life and so much of your spirit and your art has been for others, right? And it just mm. reminds me of my own um, 
my own journey of like, what does it mean to even make art as a Filipino woman, right? Like it, there, there's so much care, there's so much nurturing, there's so much giving. Even if we are the leaders in the room, right? There's still so much of that sharing, caring, generating um, aspect to, I think the way we approach work, whether we are vessels or whether we're in creation. So I, I guess from that as a jumping point, any thoughts? I um, had the honor of being in conversation with another Filipina and um, doing some disaster, um, disaster relief work in the Philippines. And um, she's doing, she's, she's an artist doing this work and she's been in it for, for 15 or so years, um, applying creative practice in building relationships and community and, um, and doing like food sovereignty, livelihood sovereignty with community. And um, I, I loved, she was giving words to me um, that I feel like were just part of my work, um, like embodied about embodiment. Um, so pakiki ramdam is a word that, that I learned about so ramdam is like felt the feeling sense of something and how that's a place where we start and that we as um, like it's just part of who we are culturally to connect with our a felt sense and be a, that be a, a jumping off point in the empathy and compassion with others um, so I feel like I just loved getting a word <laughs> Mm -hmm. um from my you know from back home that connects to something that I've been has been anchoring me for so long is in what in, in any of the um realms that I work in that this like that embodiment and embodied sense is just so important and connecting with others in their experience so that's also you know connecting into kapwa into our shared sense of self too yeah yeah. Oh, can you hear me now? I switched computers. Okay, great. Yay. Um, yeah, I just wanted to jump, uh, add on to like working with folks back, you know, back home. I always try to make sure that I bring Malaya. Um, most of my research part is really stemming from home. Um, and connecting our stories as Filipino Americans, but staying connected to, to the stories of home, meaning like smelling, hearing the sounds of home, eat, you know, eating the food, hearing the laughter, hearing the, the loud cheesiness, you know. Um, and, you know, we did some filming when we were there. We actually got, um, recently got awarded a grant to finish this film, but, um, I always tell Malaya that it's it's kind of like field research, but it's not. We we try not to approach it like we're we're researchers and we're outsiders. I I always tell her to be really um, to be very sensitive to um, how we how we also come across as Filipino Americans. I think mm -hmm. every, every time, like there's just so much like hyper awareness and care in when we share space with others and, and also always thinking about not being affected by the capitalistic virtues that may have, that I may have ingested while living here that when I'm, there and I'm researching that I'm really being with Kapwa <laughs> and I'm not I'm not thinking about a project I'm not thinking about I'm here to be in process and that is the project for mm -hmm. the most part that is what I also do here Even most of the time when I work with my dancers I would first cook a meal mm. and we would they, they, I, we would, I don't have furniture because I'm a dancer. So we will sit on my banig, 
which is the woven mat, right? We all know the banig. And we'll like eat together and break bread. And that to me, like um, a big part of making is really being true to the word community and not like the community that we throw all the time and grant making or job applications, whatever. It's mm -hmm. <laughs> really like, what is community? What is, this is my smallest unit of community. And mm -hmm. that's, we begin from here and we like spread it out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, it's so interesting. We're all talking about working in the Philippines. I realize that that is a big common factor in, in us as Filipino Americans that we create and also uh, go back home. Um, and I'll say that as a director and choreographer going back, I, I did a show in 2019 called A&Q Answers Questions, which was about the war on drugs. And it was an interview based documentary piece. And I uh, worked on it for over the course of three years. And it was it was working directly with the community and bringing uh, with a specific barangay um, uh, right outside of Makati, uh, which is so interesting, the sort of uh, big contrast of what surrounds this barangay. Um, uh, and, and I'll say that in working with local actors or with Manila-based actors, uh, it's, I quickly realized, you know, what is very Filipino about me as a theater artist? Like, I think I think I know what it is being here with other Filipino American artists, but when you go to the Philippines and you actually work with Filipino artists, you then realize what Filipino-ness is when you all connect on the thing. And I will also say that I'm very fascinated about what has been westernized in me because performance in itself I started you know I've been dancing and cultural dancing since I was five that's that's my origin story as a director really and so now if that's how I started and now I'm creating and I'm right you know directing plays and musicals and I almost exclusively work with you know non-Filipino uh, writers uh, on musicals and and um, plays and films I'm I am seeing my Filipino-ness even in those works, even if they're not about Filipino identity. So I, I have embraced that, how you know, the question where you put is, is how we kind of arrived to our work and how, what's our experience at creating as Filipino American artists. I, I think that what I've been looking at is identifying the Filipino-ness and the American-ness in me and just embracing that and everything I create, it is that because that's who I am. Because a lot of people are trying to get me to work with Filipino plays. And I'm like, that's fantastic. But also I am in everything I make and my family is in everything I make. And you know, my heart, it's all, my body's there, my personality, it's, it's all, I feel exposed every time I see something I direct. Uh, so I just wanna offer that as, as identifiers and that we, it's the, like you were saying, the more we know ourselves, the more we can arrive our, to any work we create with authenticity. Agreed, agreed. And I think from my, from my background, I started in classical ballet as my training. So in very opposite ways, like on the East Coast too. So it's like no Filipinos. I grew up with like very, very few Filipinos, fam, Filipino families or Filipino people around me. And like, for me, it was so, like classical trained Eurocentric eye art making in this kind of like white dominated space, you know? And, and so what was, as I grew up, that was a standard at which I held myself to and my brown body to, my experience to. And that was a lot of unlearning, a lot of um, rerouting displacement in my own body. It, it, was migration out of my own body. Like mm. we're gonna talk about micro migrations mm -hmm. and macro migrations of physical continents, which all five of us have experienced, as well as the micro migrations of what that means inside the internal like art making and inside your internal practices. Like for me, that really, um, you know, was a big, a big hump or a big part of um, 
of a big challenge, maybe that's the right word, the, the biggest challenge still that is like very present in the way I make work because, or even just show up as a performer or whatever I'm doing in, in the world. Like it's a very big part of me. And so it shows up. And yeah, I guess that's like my response to that. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, something I want to add to this too is on a very specific level, working with Filipino artists, uh, I, I, I've worked a lot on subtlety, uh, on subtext in, in the work of like, what do you see? What are people saying? And what do they really mean? Just creating and directing um, storytelling. And then in the Philippines, when I was directing Filipino actors, they were so expressive, just every, just so emotionally available, body, voice, emotionally and sometimes it was in my for me I was like oh actually we want to create layers it feels like too much you know can we pull back so we're we're we were having all these conversations about you know and I think I thought it was just sort of pedagogically the professor in me is like oh we have different trainings we come from different worlds but oh my gosh this incredible performance artist Bunny Kadag told me um a, a beautiful, amazing trans um, uh, artist in the Philippines. She said to me, she's like, Jessica, please, we are a suffering country. Let us feel. And that meant so much to me that actually my, my layering of like, oh, hold back, let's layer, let's manipulate the other, and the, let us, let's put it all out there. We, ne we need to. And that's also why we were talking, we were also talking about karaoke that way. They said, we, like, that's why you have a few pesos and no, you don't have shoes, but you're singing a song on the street because as a culture, we need to feel. So mm -hmm. I think that's very much linked to, to being a, a Filipino artist, a Filipino American artist, that ultimately there is a catharsis. There is, let us, we need to physically, emotionally express ourselves artistically. That's part of who we are. And, and our culture embraces that. Other, like other in comparison to maybe other Asian cultures, we embrace the catharsis of feeling through our art. Yeah, I mean, look at our telenovelas. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like, so yeah, like that's an example. But the recent one when we came back home, because um, I'm so I've normalized this because I grew up there. Um, but you know, we noticed that um, everybody sings. Even if they're just like opening the door for you at SM, the, the mall, they're opening a door and they're like, Nandito ako. <laughs> <laughs> and like, everyone's dancing in the streets. Everyone's, it's just like, if the spirit moves you, Mm -hmm. that, you know, and that's also what I what I feel like we're really in touch with spirit as a people as well. Like mm -hmm. even even negating the whole colonial religion that was mm -hmm. imposed on us. Like indigenously, we had you know connection to the divine. So mm -hmm. and that's part of that wanting to feel and speak and create is yeah. connecting to the divine. <laughs> yeah, I know I know for me creating is a path for me to reconnect um, through through the trauma of erasure. Um, that that my work is about coloring myself back in. <laughs> um, and that is, you know, in an embodied way to, to do that, um, to find, to also parse out what between what is Filipina of me and what is American, trying to understand and maybe, and shed the parts that I've just swallowed <laughs> and doesn't serve me, doesn't serve me anymore. And, and it was, you know, there to serve or to like disenfranchise me. And um, the, I'm, I'm so grateful to be making work with community, um, with my community, recognizing that like as a social practice artist, 
you know, I'm not a performer and that like creating work for performance, I create like experiences for people to be a part of and to be holding space with my people, recognizing that I am my community is so important. Um, and so like in that reciprocity where I can see myself, that we can see each other or making space for, for us to see each other and find belonging with each other in our shared um, <laughs> in our shared feeling of like disconnection and disenfranchisement or like, am I Filipino enough? Or, you know, like all the identity stuff. Um, I, I just did, did an event um, recently around belonging. And I know that, you know, even though I've been here for all these decades, um, I, you know, I was born in the Philippines, but I moved when I was just an infant. Um, I'd like to think, you know, I have enough relationship with this place, but but finding belonging in a settler colonial state um, on this land, like building relationship with this land is very complicated, um, but I am finding belonging with others, like in the diaspora that are that have these shared questions. And so, so in the work, like finding belonging together feels really good. Um, it's a type of care that, um, that I can share with, with my people that comes back to me. Oh, um, on the topic of like belonging, I guess I always feel like, since I've grown up like here and I was going to um, a really like white school where there's a lot of racism and I would always like, we do like check-ins at the beginning of the week um, about our weekends. I'd be like, I did Kali, it's a Filipino martial arts. And then um, these people would start going like, yeah, yeah, I was just like, <laughs> and I guess, also not having a lot of like Filipinos in my school and then being like, am I part, am I like really, can I say that I'm like Filipino, Filipino if I wasn't from the Philippines and I'm not like growing up with other Filipinos, but then I'm just like, like, yeah, like asking that question to myself. And then also when I was choosing high schools, I originally got into SLA Bieber, um, but I heard that I was gonna be like the only um, Asian, let alone Filipino um, in the school. So I wanted to go to um, the school for Ness instead, because I heard that it was a lot more diverse and then there were like Filipinos there and other Southeast Asians. So I went to that school thinking it was gonna be like really exciting and then there was gonna be a lot of community that I would be like connecting with. Um, but then like realizing how little resources those like communities had there, like teachers were screaming at us how they hate us. Um, and there wasn't even like pride in being like Southeast Asian or like pride from their culture. It's just very like, let me skip class. <laughs> and so. So she's back to the other school now. <laughs> yeah, I guess it's like, you're like, I feel like you're trying to find your place. And I don't know. She's even at, worried about college. Like, where, where should I go? <laughs> I'm curious if your artwork helps you find your place. Like, is that part of your process to process all you know these experiences of coming into yourself because I feel I feel like that that still even though I'm not 14 <laughs> anymore but you know that, that continues I think still we carry that with us um, yeah. art definitely does because like again she's she's always like putting me in like dances like theater things and films that connect me back to the culture and then also like back to like the school I was in in middle school, which is very white. Um, I remember in English classes, I would like find ways to try to connect back to the Philippines through my writing, like 
I would write poetry, um, talking about the Philippines and my family and how much I missed everybody. Um, and what was I gonna say? Uh, could you repeat the question, please? I think uh, Kimberly was asking if your experiences of feeling displaced between your schools affect your creative processes and like how they show up in your work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think I also like, I feel like my artwork also does connect me to other communities like mm -hmm. Um, Anafaya and like other Filipino communities because um, I feel like if I wasn't if I didn't have like you who's like putting me in shows and connecting me to like other Filipinos and like pushing me um, I wouldn't end up in these communities where I'm like I feel so supported um, yeah. mm. it's it also um brings me back to how um, intergenerational, like going back to what we've been talking about throughout this time is like the intergenerational connection of our art practices. And just, just hearing you, Malaya, say like what you said, I'm also imagining your communities are all ages, right? The art, the art communities that you've been connecting with are of all ages. And perhaps you feel closer to folks who are not necessarily your age, or maybe you do. But there is this kind of like, there is this kind of opening of in awareness and wisdom, I think, in your experience and even you feeling your, your experience, your actual personal experience of displacement in like a very real way and how that is like, you know, blown out into a macro level. You can see the, the displacement of like, I feel our people in the diaspora, you know, there's this, there's this a relational tie I think that is so also so beautiful to witness between you and your mom too, from what I see in your work. Yeah, and I think because like she was obviously coming home and feeling like she would have a bad day and this happened or some sort of microaggression. So I, there was like careful curation um, of her after school things like, okay, I need to find community. I need to find, I remember like sending you the link to Anak Bayan, which is a youth um, activist organization. Like I just emailed it to her, <laughs> like sign up <laughs> or, um, or uh, she was with WHYY, which is like our NPR here. Hmm. Um, and I just sent her the link as well, like go go do do apply for scholarship or something like that. So she would find, um, yeah, it's just careful curation because I can't rely on on school and, and our community that you know because Philly is not it, we don't really have a big Filipino community. We have to I have to really search and make the space happen. Mm. Actually, with, um, since in relation to like education, I guess there's a very little about um, like Filipinos in history, like even in the history of the US, you don't hear anything about like, like the St. Louis expedition where a bunch of like indigenous Filipinos were kidnapped and put on display. Like, you don't hear that, even though that's part of US history. Um, and I just like, I remember quarantine learning. Um, it was very random stuff we were learning, but they were kind of glorifying Spain and the US for like colonizing the Philippines and basically just like erasing the entire history of genocide and all the things that was wrong with it. Um, then you sent the poem, White Man's Burden. Oh you know? um, yeah, I sent in the poem, like the white man's burden. Um, it's like, what, what was the line again? Basic, it basically justified the um, U.S. imperialism or the Treaty of Paris. It kind of justified why the U.S. should infiltrate the Philippines because we're 
savages, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think I you sent the link and then you said that, what did the teacher say? Um, the teacher was basically like, I forgot exactly what the teacher said, but basically implying that my mom told me to say that. Like, not believing that I would have knowledge of my own of history. You told me she also said it was a beautiful poem. Oh, yeah. That was really messed up. Because there's a specific line. It's like um, calling all BIPOC people half devil and half child. Um, and she was like, wow, that's so beautiful. And like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's that's history lessons for K to 12 in the United States of America. <laughs> That's very disturbing to me. That's very disturbing. I just put in the chat the poem if anyone's interested in reading it. Um, yeah. All right. I have thoughts, but I'll save them if anyone else wants to talk first. One thing that Kimberly was saying uh, that's really speaking to me is this idea of coloring ourselves back in or putting even just, I'm thinking about how we take up space. That's just something that I, I mean, just as a, a leader, a, a professor, a director, you know, someone who's coming in to make decisions <laughs> or hire people um, or lead a room um, or an organization. It's just, uh, I, I'm constantly thinking about how we, how we are, how we are putting ourselves back into the story um, and claiming the narrative that is today, that, that I am today. And so I, I, and, embr and embracing it. And, um, and I think the thing that I'm really working with is that all of my mentors, everyone I've learned from has been, has been a man or has been a white man. And they're my professors and mentors and they've all been incredible um, key holders, I've called them, door openers, so grateful. Um, at the same time, I've had to learn how to take up space in a different way. Because when I try to be them, the way they taught me, it doesn't work. It actually doesn't work. And I feel like I'm betraying myself. Uh, and so I've had to embrace the fact that I am loud and I feel a lot and I uh, laugh really loudly and I have a big heart and I'm emotional and I, and I make my art with my heart. You know, so I, I am not a cold presence. I'm very warm. I'm like total Tita energy all the time. And that is how I lead. So I'm learning like that's, I'm, I, that's just what, that's what you get, you know? So if, if it's sometimes it's like a lot or it doesn't seem like she knows what she's doing because I'm like this all the time, you know, I, I'm not cold and, and serious and I'm not yelling at people, right? Like even I think, I'm dealing with this right now. I was like, if I was, I feel like they're expecting me to lead a certain way because that's what people have been ingrained to, to feel. So I, that's something I'm, that's something that's been coming up of even the erasure. Then now, now that we're inhabiting space in a, in, in a really powerful way as artists and leaders and mothers and, and lovers and all these things, how, how are we taking up the space again. How are we coloring ourselves back in? Uh, it's it's a conversation. It's a question. That's a beautiful, um, beautiful thing to to reflect on. And um, I I feel like I'm still I'm in that in this. You know, had a conversation with Marie. How are we carving out spaces for ourselves? And um, I have found that, you know, being a, a university professor has been uh, an important space to, to explore that, um, like to, to not have, um, I mean, to, to be a leader in that way, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and then encouraging my students, like, De developing my process by sharing it with others um, and encouraging students to anchor their work in their lived experiences in their voices and drawing from you know narratives their ancestors bringing that forward um, 
but I, yeah, in, in navigating as an artist that's, you know, collaging many different things together um, and, and finding my path that's not a path that other, that, that was set out for me, um, <laughs> right? It's, it's not something that's set out for me. But yeah, that that I have to do it in a different way, and like I'm um, so I'm like embracing. Um, it's I I say things like this is experimental, this is unorthodox. I know, but you know, just kind of be brave with me. <laughs> I tell that to my students. I'm telling it to myself. I tell that to you know in the spaces that I hold in these experiments that I that I do with people. You know, can you? Um, listen to your body and connect with this felt sense and and, and invite it to um, inform the shapes and the gestures that you make. Um, but yeah, that that's all about taking space, taking up kind of space in the shapes that that we need, we want. That's authentically the ours. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um. <laughs> I love this part. I, I'm with you too, Jessica. I'm like, I give. I think I give Tita meets mom energy <laughs> all the time, and I also like give very Ilonga. And Ilongas are very like sweet, you know. Like we're kind of known to be like sweet, and sometimes I'm even like, oh my gosh, should I be hot? You know, like I'm really sweet to my students. <laughs> like I, I think one of my students here actually, I like love hugging her and like almost like I have my niece or my cousin or, you know, and it's, I know it's not academic, whatever. <laughs> but if we have a relationship, I'm so like, yeah, I just tried to like dismantle that whole I'm a professor, you're a student. We have cheese miss time as check-ins. Um, <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> and then during Filipino American History Month, I definitely wrote an email right away to the provost and, and the, everybody, the chair. Um, it's Filipino American History Month. Are we doing something to acknowledge? <laughs> And they were like, they're saying like, oh, it's a little late, um, maybe next year, because I'm new to, to this university. So I'm like, okay, well, then next year, then, <laughs> you know, like, I'm not, and I, I, I feel like also laughter. I feel like Filipino laugh out loud. I've heard people say like, we know that Anita's in the building because we heard the laughter. <laughs> I'm like, yep. I'm here. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think in those spaces when ah, I, there was definitely a time when I, or maybe there's still some times that I tried to, to fit in because there were, I, I just had those moments as an immigrant of 20 years and trying to fit in, trying to find my own spaces of like telling myself how to act. And then I'll try to talk to myself and like, okay, snap out of it, you know, um, just be yourself <laughs> and, and yeah, be all Philippine, Filipino, Filipina, Filipina, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is, this also is like with all of what you four are saying is this kind of like what's coming up for me is just this carving of new space for our futures. Like what, what we know of our history and, and also in the, in the communities and society that we are in, that in Malaya's history class have erased the stories and also the relationship, the very intertwined relationship between America and the Philippines and how our migration is also tied into that relationship. Our familial migrations are tied into that kind of like centuries and years of decades, centuries of colonization and Western influence and how we can come into the space, like knowing that history. And I, I think for me, I'm, I really, I really, come with this with a sense of like okay my body knows my history maybe perhaps I don't know 
but my body knows my history. My body is the written blueprint of the history that my ancestors experienced, my family, my living family have experienced, my current physical experience. And I, I think like with that, there's this like need for not, not even need, but just by simply existing is like already the carving. Like we're already doing the work of carving our space just by saying something or by cooking the meal before a rehearsal or like by showing your leadership through generosity and laughter. You know, there's so, I think for me, I'm just like really feeling um, the inherent character of like what being Filipina really is when it comes to like our practices and our art making in these foreign or non Filipinx spaces. Um, yeah, so I, I really wanna thank you for your shares because this is, I think as I am like feeling into all, all of what we're sharing, I go back to the word care. Like I go back to the, word gen the words care, generosity, and like, I wanna say grace and I wanna say like ferocity because there's such a fierce, um, there's such a fierce care for like our culture, our, like the people we work with, um, our own narratives and stories. And that feels very uh, unique to like a panel like this. Mm. Um, but in that, I want to open up the floor. It's about time for us to like receive questions from all of the audience, if anyone has any questions. And also we can go back into gallery view and if anyone wants to be on video, please join us. Yeah, and we can take a, maybe a few, like, like a water break or break if we want to. <laughs> I for I think I feel I am a tita and bunso. Like I'm a I'm a, a bunso is the baby of the family. But my my like leadership style is like I'm everyone's tita, like cool tita, but I'm also the baby. <laughs> it's a very um interesting place, I think. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, even thoughts or even, um, and it, just your silence and also your care and presence is just as important as verbal. Yeah, I see a um, hand from Janelle. Yeah. Janelle, oh, hey. Hi, hello. Hi. hi. <laughs> so good to see you. Oh my gosh, wow. same here. Um, hi, my name is Janelle. I'm actually um, Canadian. I'm in Montreal. Um, I'm half Filipino, half French Belgian. And what I'm resonating with is I'm like almost to tears and I might actually start crying as I'm talking. I'm writing down like notes and notes and notes because um, I never grew up with my Filipino family. So um, I was raised by my mom, but she was on my sort of um, French um, Belgian side. So I, I learned French and I learned English. And yet I carry this body mm. that represents something else to external eyes. And so people will see me and they're like, what, you know, what are you? And, and all these things. And, and I feel like also a little bit of an imposter because I'm like, yeah, I'm Filipino. I'm like, oh, you can speak Tagalog, you speak Ilocano, you know, like, you know, chicken adobo, whatever, and all these things. And I'm like, no, I got to know my dad's side of the family when I was 18 and I don't see them much. And so you're saying all these words I'm like, wow, they absolutely know their culture. And I, and I don't, and I feel like this sort of lost soul. I feel as if like, perhaps I was adopted by a family hmm. that, and I was raised by a Canadian white family. That's exactly how I feel. And yet when you are talking about how you lead, 
it's in my blood. It's in my body. I am yeah. so emotional. I'm so loud. I'm so expressive. I'm so caring. I'm so warm. I'm so sensitive. And people don't know what to do with that. Yes. Mm-hmm. They don't right. know what to do. Yeah. And so I sometimes, yeah. sometimes they're just like, uh, they like in a really microaggressive way, separate me from, from the group or shh, shush me. And, and I'm like, what, what, why? And then I was like, oh, there must be just something wrong with me. Mm. And I never realized until this moment, yes. five minutes ago, oh, it's my Filipino. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, well, I need to know more. I need, I want to learn. I want to learn the culture. I want to cook. I want to eat, you know, like my auntie made me, but I was like, what is this magic? And I'm, I'm like this 38 year old in this like baby's Filipino body. And I'm like, mm-hmm. show me the way, like, what is mm-hmm. our world? Who are our people? Mm-hmm. Because I am you, because I never grew up knowing these things, but I'm carrying it in my body. And now I'm experiencing the feedback mm-hmm. from the world of being in this brown, expressive, caring, mm-hmm. joyful, like celebratory yeah. short body yes <laughs> uh, I thought Janelle. I needed to figure oh. it out Janelle something's wrong with you, you gotta figure it out people don't like you like, oh no it's just because I'm Filipino mm-hmm. that's why I love spaces like this to where we can see ourselves we can see each other I'm so relieved that you know in the, the most recent years of like actively trying to build community actively trying to connect with others where we have you know some shared so that I'm like piecing myself back together and that's why I like brought up this uh, word the pakakiramdam like and the the kapwa and bayanihan like these words that are part of how we operate in the world whether we know the words or not they're Mm -hmm. part of our modalities and 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 I love the arts I love you know our creative practice as a way for us to to like in a chant like open a portal and feel ourselves mm-hmm. and recognize right. that what emerges is is like it's embedded within our DNA. That's just how we are, right. you, you know. Um, yes. And and then to, and to see it in others and get affirmation and be like, yeah, yeah, like to to re-anchor ourselves. Um, and after we might you know have a lifetime of feeling lost or feeling disconnected or feeling like we can't see ourselves like I'm so relieved that my child has books and things around him where he is like mommy that's me like I never had that like I remember when Mulan came out and I was like whoa in Asian and I was like but but yeah, that, that we can see ourselves, I think is really important that we need to have spaces and conversations like this. Yeah. yeah. And they're very, and I, I'm so thankful because I've never felt mm-hmm. that much belonging. I'm like, mm-hmm. oh my goodness, they're Filipino and they're artists. Like I'm in, I'm so mm-hmm. in, I need this, you know? And I just want to release you of the judgment of like, I'm behind or any of that, because I'll even, even when I go to the Philippines, I don't, I'm not fluent in Tagalog. And I've worked there and I've created there and I've taught lectures there. And I, I, I continue to travel almost every year back to the Philippines and I'm slowly learning, but I, it's not, I don't have the time or commitment to, to that. And there was a lot of me like having my, my parents, like forcing them to teach. To, we didn't want to, we were very ashamed of our Filipino-ness growing up. But I also want to just, what I released myself of is that shame or bl- or, or judgment of I'm not enough or I should be something I'm like you know what I don't speak and then I've even had Filipinos in the Philippines artists shame me of course playfully you know of like this is you should have and why are you and you're so this and you so that. I said I don't and I'm very honest I'm like I grew up this way this is what I know this is what I eat this is what I don't eat but also I'm here Mm -hmm. I'm Mm -hmm. here and I'm here to learn with you and I'm here to learn from and I was like I've made the commitment I paid the flight I'm here for this many weeks and I'm here. There are a lot of people who are not even making that commitment to even come back home. So I have to tell them like, I'm here to learn. I'm not here to teach or colonize. I'm here to, to actually experience. And I've made a commitment with time and money to 
learn about home, you know, and, and I would say the same thing, hanging out with Filipino friends is like, there's, there's no comparison. I, I'm, le I'm le relieving myself of, I actually am exactly what I am. And part of that is, is my Filipino-ness and it shows up in different ways. Yeah, we need to honor the story, I think. And there's a reason why I don't speak my parents' language is because they had to assimilate you yes. know, and there's a reason, like, we, we developed, uh, you know, strategies for, for, for navigating this world. Um, and, and we can't fault ourselves for that. We can't. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for sharing, Janelle. Um, so I have a question in the chat from Fajardo Canlas, hope I pronounced it correct, your name. So much of the discussion revolves around knowing the culture, knowing your energy, being strong in who you are. Can you talk about instances where that strong knowing was challenged or derailed in any way? What brings you back to yourself? For me, what brings me back to myself is my, um, my home space. My home space, but not really like physical home space, but my home space in, in me. Um, I really, I call my mom when I'm having a hard time. I, even when we've had rocky relationship, I've called my mom. I, I really lean on her as a support and a pillar of like how I remember who I am, if that makes sense. Because as an artist, it's easy to, and as a vessel, it's easy to kind of take on, take on, take on. And I think for me, the things that really root me back from challenge and root me away from displacement is like going back to what's home for me. And that's the people in my life, my friends, my chosen family, and my real family. Um, yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh, I'll add to that. I was like, I'll oh, pick. I could. There's a lot of stories of when I don't when it's being challenged on a daily. Every time I walk in a room, um, yeah, <laughs> like just showing but face. Yeah, just walking in. Um, people wondering who is in charge. Um, and it's the four eleven <laughs> woman to the in front of everyone, maybe. Um. But I, I will say that what's interesting about, I do rely on my parents, but the interesting thing is that I grew up, I love them so much, but there's a lot of passive aggression going on and a lot of secrets are like a lot of what we don't talk about and I don't want to perpetuate that. So actually mm -hmm. sometimes it's a lot, they're, they're helping me cope or quiet or deal. And actually I, I'm trying to challenge that, that that's the cycle of trauma I'm trying to undo, which is actually, I, I speak my truth. I stand up for myself, I hold strong. So actually uh, emotional support in my life is that if I need to feel absolute my family, but if I need to actually stand up for myself and have a voice, that is, I, I, I have a very strong meditation practice. So, uh, and, and to my body, I, I, as we're all dancers here, like I need to connect with my body and to remember that how strong, how strong I am. And my way of being strong is different than other people's way of being strong. Thank you. Um, another question. I'm, I'm just gonna continue with the questions. We have so many hands up as well. Is that okay with everyone? Yeah, okay, cool. So the next question is, hi, thanks for sharing from Grace. Thank you, Grace. Can you share if you have encountered micro or macro aggressions even within predominantly liberal East Asian American spaces? Uh, oh God, yeah. am I answering so fast? What? Uh, why are you hitting me? No, 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 I mean the, the university. Oh gosh, should we say that to everyone? Wait, don't, don't give the names. Just so <laughs> we're, we're in safe space here at the, okay? <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, I've been, um, after like finding myself, trying to find the company that's right for me, I did like perform for another company that is, because um, I, was a little bit confused. I thought that, okay, if I dance for an Asian company, I would feel like I belonged. But um, there are Far East, Far Easterns that called me um, like a jungle and wild. 
um, oh, y'all Filipinos are a little, because I, because I'm a little loud in the rehearsal space. <laughs> I'm always laughing and I'm always making chistes or I make faces when something's like wrong or said that was like, I can't believe you said that. <laughs> and my face will go like this. Like, you know, <laughs> and or like the I got I got typecasted and, you know, in contemporary contemporary that is wild. That's the words that would be used, like, you know, be the wild thing that you are, you know, um, so I got, that was my um, yeah, I got typecasted. And then the recent one that Malaya wants me to cheese miss is. <laughs> Um, I guess I was vying for a position in university. I don't know if I should say that, but anyways, um, I just heard through the grape grapevine that um, after being shortlisted, they picked somebody who spoke Mandarin because um, there was a lot more Mandarin speakers and they, um, there are a lot of international students so the university's getting more money from, from that. And I guess then I realized, oh, wow, I guess I spoke the wrong language. <laughs> Um, but yeah, those are the two stories I can think of right now. I, I want to chime in that I do feel as a Filipinx artist and a person, I do feel that I am not Asian enough. And I know in my communities and circles that this is not something that, it's something that I, not only I feel is that I, um, I don't feel Asian enough. I don't, I feel more at times closer to uh, my Mexican friends than I do with my Asian friends, um, sometimes in terms of culture and in terms of like, of, um, of, yeah, just culture. And I feel, I feel as also a, a brown body, you know, I can't, like, I think we're all saying this in, um, in very similar ways is that like our small brown bodies are seen in certain ways. And I, for one, like feel I am seen in a, in a certain way that is a lot of work to not internalize it. And also not a lot of work to prove, right? I have to, I feel in my younger years, I really had to prove of a certain kind of person that I am or am not based on the projections put on me. And so much of that is, um, is also from even like within um, inter-Asian spaces and um, Eastern Asian, even Southeast Asian spaces is a, is, a, is a question of like our people were also colonized by Asian communities and Asian countries. So what does that look like when we um, show up in Asian spaces as we do with so much Western influence, with so much the centuries of colonization from um, our own neighbors that, uh, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of this generational um, information. And I, I would even say it's like micro macro, but it's micro macro aggression, but it's also um, at times, um the erasure is a violence if that makes sense like if it the the erasure and the and the and the lack of conversation the lack of um not being seen as enough of whatever is the violence and that is something that uh still taking time to articulate also because um I think as Philip as a Filipina person, Filipina artist, I am careful with how I um, with how I I separate myself from Asian communities, and I, I'm careful with how I participate as well because we need to be together in ways. You know, like I feel like I do I do have my own narrative. And my, my culture has our own narrative and history, yet we work together in this country as a whole. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm very sensitive to this. So if, if I can just add one more thing. I do clearly remember when I first came into the country and then I had to check the box um, because in the Philippines growing up, we, we didn't have like categories of like racial categories. 
you know, that's never really asked because everyone's Filipino. Like maybe people ask like where families from, like uh, what barangay, right? But we don't have like Asian, Latino, black, white, that sort of thing. So when I came here, that was the first time I've ever encountered here. And that was in 2000. And then I asked like, what am I? And they said, you're Asian. And then um, that was kind of, a little, it was hard for me to process at first because learning history, you know, we suffered so much in the hands of the Japanese with the Bataan Death March. There was a, a genocide of Filipinos. Um, um, and then currently, I don't know if everyone's aware, but um, China has taken our Philippine Sea so Filipino farmers have to pay Chinese government for our own harvest. Um, so, the, and then if you go to, I mean, SM, and a lot of the, the uh, a lot of the elite families that's ruling the country right now, the Kuangos and um, the owner of uh, the C's, Henry C, all of, all of those folks, even Aquino, they're all coming from, um, a Chinese lineage. So I come here and I'm like, oh, I'm now to be in solidarity with everyone. That was really hard for me to grapple. But then here, the stories are different. Now there's stories of marginalization from these communities that in Asia, they're like colonizing us. But here there's Japanese internment there, you know, and just um, Asian exclusion, Chinese exclusion, uh, exclusion acts, you know, like, so there's now there, there, there's like a, a history that's different from the, from what is the his what from the history on the other side. Does that make sense? So then I'm like, now I'm finding myself to be more empathetic because I'm here. So it's like, I change where, where if I'm here, I feel more like I belong to that category. Then when I'm home, I'm 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 Filipino. <laughs> so complex. <laughs> I I would like to speak on on this too um, about about well I think to go back to like the value of spaces like this affinity spaces where we can have conversations we can see each other and be to talk about like the more of the nuanced um you know differences of our experiences that despite us being filipino and we're in the diaspora we are you know there are seven thousand islands i mean just the philippines seven thousand islands we're a tribal but you know like deeply and we have all different different ex different kinds of diasporic experiences like I, I grew up in the midwest it's very different from growing up on the west coast or here on the east coast and um and so you know things like crab mentality and how like we can't really all be like homogenized is really important to acknowledge that there are so many differences between us um that that you know, we can't we can't just smooth it over and and then so then expanding that to what is asian american um you know it's just it's extra complicated because um you know people ask me like oh what are you in the philippines they're, they're they they were like ni hao or they're like i'm kapkunka and i go sawatika like not not record not clocking me as filipina and um you know there's a reason why i look this way there's a reason. And I was just actually like getting on a bus on 14th Street here in, in Manhattan. And I saw some like Chinese elders and and they they saw me. And then I felt like there was a mutual acknowledgement. And and I was like, oh, you know, they must think I'm Chinese, not Philip, you know. And I'm like, yeah, there's a reason why I look this way, is because my great you know, my grandmother was part Chinese. Or like, you know, we have within us, you know, the the palimpsest, the archive of our colonial history, and and our differences too. So, it's um yeah, it's just it is so complicated to um to meet you know 
also colorism and, and all those differences within um, our Filipino communities too. Um, yeah, I just wanted to add on to that, like being like, mistaken for not even Filipino. Like I know like when I went to the Philippines for a month, um, there were a lot of people who were like, where are you from? Like they didn't think I was Filipino. Um, and then I remember just recently, I was like getting bubble tea at this one shop in West Philly. And um, the owner was asking where I was from. And I was like, I'm Filipino. And he was like, oh, you don't look Filipino. <laughs> and I was just like, I had like a little miniature identity crisis. Cause I'm like, I'm already growing up here. And I'm like feeling disconnected from all my family and like, having my Lolo pass away in the pandemic and not seeing like my family now. And then all my family that's in the US is like in the West Coast. And I feel like I'm connected to the culture, but it's like made me question again. And I'm just like, how Filipino am I? And I had like my own little mini identity crisis. And yeah, I just wanted to say that. Yeah, just on top of that, like, I feel like um, the the need to prove our authenticity is such a colonial construct because like we are, you know, we've always been migrating from place, you know, intermingling, intermixing, like trading, um, you know, like exchanging because of shared kinship or, you know, or for, for various reasons. I think like needing to define that we are like, you can anchor specifically to, a, a place. I mean, I just, I, I would, I, I would like us to be able to sit in a more fluid um, sense of identity, which is, you know, we're from the islands. Is this like water element sense of who we are? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, let's move to uh, hands. Um, Veronica. Nice to see you. Thank you for being here. But you had the hand first. Oh, so good to see you. So good to um, see you. My question was kind of already answered. It was very related to the first question in the chat. But I, I when I had my hand up, I wanted um, Jessica to speak specifically as an intimacy choreographer, how that shows up for you. Um, because we all use our bodies and movement as an artistic practice, but that's very different. Um, and I'm wondering, also, I'm, I'm um, doing an intimacy, intimacy coordination training next weekend, right. and like as also a 411 Filipina, um, <laughs> <laughs> curious when you step into a space, like how do you navigate that and um you know working mm -hmm. in predominantly white spaces mm -hmm. are there is there pushback with cis white men or even not even like non-asian um people and yeah and women i'm just curious how you navigate and how you um mm -hmm. facilitate that space as a filipino Thank you so much. I'll share just a few points on this. I joke that uh, pushback from cis white men is my specialty. Uh, it's I'm like, it's my sweet spot. I was like, I, I just know how to just stroke a little and push. I just think it's, yeah, I, I figured it out. Uh, but uh, as an intimacy, just to catch everyone up on that in case that's a new field, it's for some people that any kind of intimacy or kiss or touch or any you know, sex scenes on theater and film. Um, there is now a whole world of us being trained to choreograph that, direct that, coordinate that when it comes to underwear or how the scenes are filmed or shot. Um, I got into it because I worked, uh, I worked with a really bad one on a, on a show that was mostly, mostly with trans, uh, non-binary, queer bodies of color. Uh, and the intimacy person was a white cis woman that didn't know how to lead that space. And so it ended up really badly that we end up removing her from the process. 
So then I trained in it being like, there has to be a better way to do it. And I realized that the way we express ourselves with our bodies, especially artists of color, I was feeling like there's needs to be more representation in that. So I don't do it as a, a side thing and I'm very selective of the projects I do, but I'm finding the need for that more, especially when it comes to how we use our bodies in an intimate way. And when there's, especially when it's artists or bodies um, who have, who are the global majority, but when there's a, uh, a presence of uh, a man or mostly white women in this field, it can be very harmful when they're telling you how to kiss or how to, even if it's unintentional, it can be very harmful. Um, so there's just a care to it uh, and a sensitivity that I feel that I have. I feel like a lot of the maternal, the, all the things we talked about, the emotional side, I'm maternal, I'm, you know, very, you know, friendly, that actually really helps me in that work. Uh, so I, I, I've learned that all the things that, you know, uh, oh, actually, one thing I want to mention is that um, I grew up without, uh, in a um, suburban Pennsylvania, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania is where I grew up. I was one of three girls and we were kind of called, seen as like the sort of Kardashians of our high school because we were exoticized. So in a way, I didn't grow up with people hating us. In fact, everyone was like ooing and aahing and, and sexualizing us. And I didn't realize that was what that meant at the time. And so now as a woman growing, you know, now in my, my 30s, I'm... Um, mid thirties, I have a, a new relationship with my body, with my brown Filipina body, and I've really embraced my own sensuality. So I just want to put that in the space that, that I grew up with my parents. They still, to this day, they dance, they kiss in front of us. My dad can't keep his hands off my mom. Like I grew up with a very uh, touchy uh, sort of, we were a very openly sexual family about our bodies. And so I've learned, and that's not very Asian. I have to be on, you know what I mean? Like that's in terms of the stereotype or what people say. I was like, so also my relationship to sensuality is very, is very intimate and I've embraced that in this work. Yeah, happy to talk more on the side on that too, Veronica. Yeah, for sure. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. We only have uh, two more minutes left to the panel and I wanna um, touch on che, uh, Che's question above. And I'll read it quick. My mom and I have been opening up our conversations to acknowledge the intergenerational curses from colonization, forced migration, ecological genocide, and how that results in very real consequences in our lineage, including chronic pain, mental illness, and dissociation, woof. Given that beauty is both a sacred value and societal ideology within Filipino culture, I am curious if you can speak on the duality of beauty with the ugly and or grotesque I'm thinking about the intense supernatural mythology coming out of the Philippines, including a lot of darkness and shadow work, like with Aswang, and wanting to balance this duality in my craft while staying in my power. There's a lot of trickster energy here. Wow. <laughs> I feel like I always channel spirit before I work, so I hope I can respond to this. Um, uh, I grew up, apparently when I was younger, I played with like aswangs. I always had friends and I, um, even now it's still a practice of mine to like, when I'm walking through trees and stuff, I'm always saying tabi tabi po, which is you, to ask permission from the spirits. Um, I'm not sure if I see it as ugly. I when I feel like I'm in my power, I do like, I do feel like I'm connecting to Babay lands. Um, and what, you know, even when we talk about being aunties and mothers, um, that's Babay land work for me. Um, I hope, I hope, yeah, I, get, I think that's, and, and I, I, I all, I have a practice of, um, connecting light and candle and talking to my dad and my Lola, depending on what is needed for the day. <laughs> or uh, I ate too much ice cream today and I know my dad really likes ice cream. So I like talk to him and I'm like, oh, I'm sure you would like, have liked this because I know you love ice cream. <laughs> um, 
I don't know if I answered the question, but I know it. Yes. Thank you. We have to end. I'm so sad to say, oh, this has been such an amazing um, conversation and just the beginning. And I want to reiterate that it is um, always from a place of learning in which we come to you. And um, I did um, drop our emails, our Instagrams, our websites. So please keep in contact with us. Um, I really want to thank Asian American Arts Alliance for the space and for allowing us the opportunity to chismis and uh, talk through a lot of these important conversations. So thank you, Lisa, Justine, and Anjur very much. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, we'll definitely be following up with a uh, link to the recording of tonight's discussion. And um, yes, I will. Uh, we'll probably get to that early next week. Um, there was a lot, a lot here, and we're just so grateful for for you all showing up and sharing your stories and your experiences um, with such care and candidness. So, oh, I see all the love in the chat. Um, yeah, thank you all. Have a good night, and we will keep in touch. Take care, everyone. Mm -hmm. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Salama. 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 <laughs> wow, that was amazing. I know. Thanks for bringing us together, Marie. I know. You did it's a beautiful honor. job. It is an honor, really. Like, wow, I feel so grateful. Oh, yeah. And How does everyone feel? There's so much to say. I know. Right? So much to say. Oh, I thought time. I thought an hour and a half was going to be really like, but no, no, no. What no. an honor! Wow. Okay, okay, everyone, have a great night. Yeah, and I'm gonna. I just want to say I'm gonna email all of um, Marie, the panelists, because we want to um, compensate you for your time, and so we are able to offer an honorarium of one hundred and fifty dollars each. And so I will be sending that information over email on Monday, um, but just go and enjoy your weekends. Um, I just want to say thank you so much. It was a beautiful discussion. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Thank you. Also, we'd um, like to uh, we did have the connecting, right? So we should all be friends. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. To be continued. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> We're copy pasting. <laughs> wait, 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 one second. Please. We got to copy the message so we can. Oh yeah, let me. I can save the chat. Yeah, and then I'm gonna follow that. every all of you all on. You wanna do a photo? I can oh, see we're one. Oh, thanks. Oh, yes. Oh, this is mine. Oh, this is yeah. a I can um let me. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry that we don't that. have um. Just uh, 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 oh. Oh, we missed it. We can. We we recorded it, so we can do it. Yeah. Maybe do a screenshot. Yeah, let me. I can take a photo of the of you all first. Um, Lisa, well, do you want me to stop your video? I, I, uh, quick. I got it. Oh, you got it. Oh, okay. Wait, I just I stopped it and then it started again. <laughs> You're like, uh... okay. Let me see if I can. Um, the pen. Yeah, I can. Spotlight for everyone. <laughs> <laughs> this is really funny. Uh, add spotlight. Bing, 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 bing. Oh, okay. Here we go. Ready? And do a screenshot. One, two, three. Oh, oh. got it. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>